Um, good morning, everyone. Um, probably put some faces to names here. Um, my name's Rebecca Perfect. I probably email you quite a lot. And this is um, Cheryl Morrell. And um, we're going to um, talk to you about LGPS data requirements. So it is a bit of a double act this morning. I'll do a little bit and then I'll pass on to Cheryl and then Cheryl will pass back to me. So, um, okay. We're just going to spend about 45 minutes right up to the break um, to talk to you about data requirements. Um, the importance of your data that employers give to us is, has really always been really significant. Um, it's, the, it's how we calculate people's benefits. However, um, since the new scheme in um, April has moved to a care scheme, and never an annual of, um, accrual of uh, pension benefits, um, it's even more important now that the information that you give us um, is correct, um, and um, because we will be, and Chow will, will be showing you later um, how we update people's records. So, um, previously in the final salary scheme, we used to ask for someone's, uh, in the final salary scheme, we used to ask for someone's final salary um, at that point of leaving the scheme, so you had time to kind of look at it and then calculate it at that point based on all of their service. Now, in a care scheme, we're looking at someone's benefits annually and updating their pensions accounts annually, so it's really important at that point in time that we um, have the right pay figures, for instance. Okay, so some of the things as are up on there, we're going to look at why, what, how, um, that you tell us um, um, about uh, data. So, a um, bit of a scary slide here, the legal requirements. So, um, some of the legal requirements are specific, obviously, to the local government pension scheme regulations. We've put the latest form on there that I know about. Probably Debbie can tell you um, in her pension experience, lots more that go back um, prior to 1992. But um, these are the last four that, um, that I can think of, really. That, and these are quite really significant changes to the pension scheme. I mean, in 2008, um, we thought we had a quite significant change, but um, last year, with moving to a care scheme, the, the, the scheme um, changed entirely. Um, not only do we have these regulations, but we have amendments to the regulations and the transitional regulations. So I think if I listed them all, I'd probably need about 10 slides, but I haven't bored you too much with all the regulations that we have to um, adhere to, as well as yourselves. So not just the LGPS regulations, it's um, a wider, um, regs that we have to um, adhere to. So the Public Service Pensions Act, with the local government pension scheme part of the public service um, scheme, we, there are regulations are, uh, required that, um, that we have to adhere to, as well as disclosure of, of regulations. That's more my remit in terms of the communications. So the disclosure regulations tell us how we must um, tell our scheme members about their pension. So, um, and that's why we're asking you for some information as well for for benefit statements, for instance. And the pension regulator, so um, Robert will be able to tell us um, the role that the, the pension regulator has um, a little bit later on. And obviously HMRC and lots of other occupational pension scheme regulations that we all have to stick to. So there's a lot on that side. So um, as part of being able to supply us with um, all the data to, to meet those regs, this is the, this slide shows some of the data requirements <coughs> that we have um, from our employers. So on the left-hand column, it's left up there, yep, um, some of the data requirements that I'm going, I won't go through them all, Joe will all talk about this in a bit more detail, but some of these things that you've been giving us for a long time, I haven't changed, obviously, new starters and, and opt-ins and, op and opt-outs. But it's important just to, um, just to get over the message that what some things that have changed since April last year. So the third one from the bottom there, move into 50-50, that's something completely new that we've had since in the scheme change last year. So we need to know when someone moves into the 50-50 scheme, so that's paying half their contributions to receive half their benefit. And then also we need to know when we move back. So that's just, um, some of these aren't um, are, uh, new. And the last thing on, on there, the data requirements, um, the pension will pay. So you, you heard me say before, when scheme regulations change, they don't just change and we'll forget about what everything that's happened. They change, but we still have to take into consideration the previous um, rules and regulations, definitions of things that have um, stood before, because obviously members have service, um, if you're in the pension scheme yourself, you'll have service um, in the scheme um, as of that point. So we have to look at the benefits based on when the regulations were laid. So it's important to, to um, 
to remember that pensionable pay still has two, um, now has two definitions, the, two, the 2008 um, regulation definitions, the 2014, and we will talk a bit more about that a bit later. And then there's some data requirements which are a bit more periodic, year-end returns, and on starts, ABCs, valuation over three, three years. So there's a lot of information which you need to give us. A really small thing, but actually quite significant sometimes, is your contact details. If something changed, if your payroll providers change, or you leave, or someone that you know in your office is leaving, it's really important to let us know. So if that person's left and they were the authorised signature um, for your organisation, means that we can't accept leaders forms for someone going until that person signed that form. So it's just a bit of admin really, just to keep us kind of up to date with what's going on with you. So the employer's role in the LGBS, as I said, has always been really, really important. What you provide us um, ultimately, obviously, um, keep us in a job and um, allows us to calculate members' benefits. So, but the membership of the LGBS is an important part of your role. It's an important part of the, um, the employment package that you offer. Even if you're a closed scheme, so you don't have any more new, new members, I'm sure the members in your scheme will see, uh, see it as an important, important part of um, them working for, for you. Your responsibilities and our responsibilities, as worth reminding, are available um, in the, are um, outlined in the administration and governance and um, compliance statement. So these are available on our website. And um, these basically cover how you meet your responsibilities, so the processes, what's expected of you, what you can expect from us. So those are really important documents, and um, every time we do go to change those, we do um, try and consult them, and we will send you out an email saying, we're looking at changes, is there anything that you want us to look at as a, um, as a result of you know, um, your work processes? So be sure to keep yourself um, familiarised with those. Also, you've heard Debbie talk about the portal. We've got um, um, the employer's guide. For those of you who've been um, involved with our um, work for a while, you will remember the hard copy employer's guide probably sat on a dusty shelf somewhere. Hopefully it wasn't too dusty, but what we felt was that because we've had so many regulations changes, it's best to have it all online, all going online, um, so then you don't have to keep on remembering to update that bit of paper in that guide. So the employer's portal, which is part of our website, is a passworded area because we don't want anyone going in there. But it's where the employees by tell and um, lots of other documents. And you're going to definitely talk about the certificates for ill health guidance. And then, uh, um, and then more stuff as the time goes on. As we see it, uh, you, know, you might need a bit more guidance and things. We will keep on updating it. I would 100% as well, just at the last point there, um, recommend to bookmark <coughs> the LGPS um, regs um, website. I'm in and out of it all day. But any type of, um, there's the HR and payroll guides which have been issued by the LGA, so they're quite, uh, they're the overview of the regulations um, and how you should be applying them. Our in, in employer's guide it basically tells you how, um, in terms of our processes and your day-to-day -day stuff, how you should be applying them. So definitely have a look in that website because there's lots of, te um, lots of technical guidance in there, which is only there to support you really. So I talked about the LGPS regs um, previously, so actually in the regulations and the, the next two slides actually take extracts from the regulations, so it's not just an overly worded slide, but it, it shows you really that the regulations are quite specific of all, um, in the fact that what we have to do as administrators and what you guys have to do in terms of um, your employer's role. So our, some of our responsibilities outlined um, in the regs are that we have to decide any question with regards to a person's previous service or employment. So Trevor will cover this, but we normally do that from, um, or we, uh, we have to do it through the new starter form. So that's just a really important part that we, we need you guys to give a new starter form so we can make that decision of, okay, this person's got previous service. So it's just getting those messages across because we've got some responsibilities. Um, and we have to notify the scheme member as soon as reasonably practical. But um, that basically means that if there are any changes that we have to notify the member, so in effect if there's any changes to employment, you need to let us know. Um, we still have to issue annual benefit statements. Um, one change that we've had is that annual benefit statements for this year have to be issued by the 31st of August, rather than the October deadline that we've previously had. So it's actually been brought forward by a couple of months, which means that we have to get all the data from you 
um, even quicker and up to date um, so we can actually send those benefit statements out to members and to keep in mind with what the regs are telling us. Um, and also, um, at the last point there, we have to pay um, lump sums and any interest on any lump sum for any unpaid amount. So those are our <coughs> snapshot, we've got lots of other responsibilities, but those are a snapshot of um, some of ours which are written actually in the regulations. So some employer responsibilities which are outlined in the regs are um, the contributions that you deduct from members' um, salaries. Um, you have to pay those over to us by the 19th, so we don't cut that day at the end, it's more convenient um, for us. That is written into the regulations. And there's things that you have to give us as a result of giving us those contributions, so you have to um, give us a list of exactly um, who those contributions are for, and you have to give us that information at the year end as well. And um, the scheme employer um, inform us of all decisions, i.e. taking someone into the scheme, and then employers guide obviously outlines how you do that, how you tell us, um, so and how you actually discharge in your function, so how you actually do that. So you must let us know of all the decisions that you're making. So bring someone into the scheme, you need to let us know. Someone's reducing this app, reducing their um, or changing their job, you need to let us know because all these decisions do affect their uh, pension benefits. Okay, I'll pass now on to Cheryl. <laughs> Uh, good morning everybody. Uh, what I'd like to do now then is just to talk through, following on from what Becky's gone through, is to how you actually then provide that data to us. Um, that is going to depend very much on who does your payroll. Um, so the first thing I've noted at the top of there is that uh, we do get interfaces coming through on a monthly basis. And those come through currently for anybody who uses Shropshire Council or Telford and Payroll Services. Um, and we've been having some monthly interfaces from them now for quite a few years and generally they've been working quite well. Um, although what we are looking at doing now over the next couple of years is pilot a new system, uh, which is just there at the bottom of the list, which is called Our Connect. Um, and what that is going to do is try and cut out some of the manual intervention that we have at the moment, where um, a system will sit between the two systems, the employer system and also the pension system, and then take that information and, and through. So we're quite excited about that project. Um, we have signed up for it, we've wanted it for a while, and we've had the go-ahead, um, and it's about to kick off very soon, um, and uh, you know, we're, we're really looking forward to, to moving on with that. Um, and what we also introduced last year from April, as Beck has already said, with the new care scheme coming in, um, we decided at that point in time that not only did we want to streamline some of our processes for everybody else, um, that we would actually um, bring in the monthly return so that we could then be getting other data through that we now need to be putting into the system hopefully on a monthly basis. The key um, data for that one is the care pay um, that we're getting through and um, what I'm going to go and do um, a little bit later on is I'm going to actually bring up a record and show you how we're using that care pay from those monthly returns and how then an individual can actually look at their own record um, to see their pension account building up. Uh, we've still got pen forms around um, and I'm going to run through a few of those in a moment um, and also we do get email confirmation sometimes coming through for information um, or it might be an agreed template for certain bits of um, information that come through um, and I've obviously mentioned iConnect. Becky's already mentioned that we need um, for you to keep us updated with who your contacts are but all the pen forms that we have have to be signed by an authorised signatory so it is really important that if that person does leave that we know about that and that also we know then who the next person is going to be who else can then sign those forms um, the member can obviously inform us of any of their um, personal detail changes but key data is required by, by you as the employer um, we we'll just put up there um, our website address because Becky's already mentioned um, about some of the things that are on there but uh, Deb has mentioned as well about um, the ill health certificates there is that area of the employer website and that's the address for it up there um, and then when I go in and show you a member record um, that's how the employees as well they can go in and they can find lots of information about the scheme on our website too so drilling down a little bit then into um, the, the, the various parts of, of the data that we need to look at new starters. So this is obviously anybody who's eligible to join the scheme. So if you're an employer here from a closed admission agreement, this part might not actually apply to you. Um, but um, new, new eligible employees coming in, 
must be issued with a new member form and a brief scheme guide within six weeks of starting in the local government pension scheme. And you can do that electronically, and I understand that quite a few employers now do do that for feedback that we've received. It might be via um, links to our website or emails going out. Um, and you must also inform your employee of the contribution rate that they're then going to be paying from, from their, have deducted from their pay. Um, and again, um, you know, that could be that you include it in contracts of employment or, or could be um, an email um, for, for that. And then you need to ensure that the employer and the employee contributions are automatically deducted from pay. Um, and as you all know, the employer contribution rate changes every three years following the pension fund valuation. And then the employees are determined by the bounding table and that's going to pop up on the next slide. Um, and then you need to tell us about it. As though, although you've issued a new member form, and as for to those individuals, as much as we need that to come back in from them, because as Becky had already mentioned, we do need to know about any past service that they might have. Unfortunately, we don't get them in for everybody. So you need to tell us who all your new starters are. So for the monthly interfaces for the Shropshire payroll and Telford and Reaky payroll, so those have been coming through. Um, but what we've done this year is we're already on version two of that monthly spreadsheet. We did add a tab to it so that you can list on there who your new starters are. And then we're able to lift that information off there and put it straight into our system. And that's been working really well, I have to say, for, for those of you that are sending that into us, it has been working really well. Um, and um, you know, we're able to, um, you know, now as you're sending us contributions in care pay, we know we've got a record for everybody that's, that's on that. So the contributions, um, this table just seems to expand every time they change regulations and just bring in more and more. So we're now into nine contribution rates and pay bands. The table that's up there doesn't show the, um, the part for anybody who goes into the 50-50 scheme. Um, so there is a little bit more to the side of that table as well. And the other thing that did change from April was that um, your rate is now based on actual pensionable pay, not, not full-time equivalent as it was before. So that might have made a bit of difference for some part-timers from last April. And it will include um, overtime and additional hours. Um, every April, we would then um, the regulations then say that you need to just reassess that, that band but you also need to have a policy in place as to whether you're going to reassess that band during the year as well. Um, so should somebody have a promotion during the year, will you then reassess the rate that they then pay on? So uh, you, you need to consider that. And Becky's already mentioned as well, contributions then must be paid to us uh, by the 19th of the month following the month of deduction. And it is really important at that point in time that we do know the total of employees and the total of um, employers' contributions for that payment so that we can account for them quickly. Now the monthly return, for those of you that are using that, that is acting as your remittance advice now. Um, and again, that's worked really well because it's meant that it's cut out lots of paperwork that we don't need to have anymore. Um, and um, for those of you that use Shropshire or Telford and Reaky payroll services, they inform us as well. Um, and Shropshire have just started doing that electronically. So changes to other circumstances then, um, during the, the, the life, if you like, of somebody being on our system. Um, obviously personal details, um, the member could tell us about this themselves, but we do also rely on you doing that. So, you know, should they get married, their name change, their address change. Um, and the, the, there are the same three ways in which they can do that. So there's a PEN 01 form that can be found on our website, or it's through the interfaces, um, but we're also looking at, again, on the monthly return, adding some further tabs. Now, that might sort of horrify some of you, but I can see somebody at the back nodding who I know had asked for it, so uh, we'll delight others. Um, we are looking at version three, um, and what we might do is just ask one or two people to just try that for us, um, just to see how that works. So we're gonna be adding some of the things where I'm talking about pen forms, we're going to look at adding those onto there. So again, we can cut down on paperwork and we can just try and streamline processes better. Um, hours changes, that's a form panel to pen 02, interfaces or something we're hoping to add onto monthly return. But I think I just wanted to sort of mention there that because of the new scheme, as you all know, changing to the care scheme, 
We don't necessarily need to know about hours changes for everybody anymore, unless they're covered by the underpin. So for anybody who was 55 or over on the 31st of March 2012, we do have to look at whether their benefits would have been better under the old scheme rather than in um, the new care scheme. So for those people, we've got to look at service. So if they're part-time, we need to know if we prorated that service correctly. Most employers are still tending to send um, hours changes through to, to us, and that's fine. We're happy to collect the hours changes and we're happy to keep amending records. Um, we're certainly getting all hours changes coming through for Shropshire. Um, and, and, and any of their external payrolls. So absences, um, strikes, uh, we did have some last year and it's always typical when you've got a new scheme and uh, we have to deal with strikes. And those are always on an agreed template. So Becky uh, will email um, a spreadsheet out with those on. And we do ask, um, I think I'm right, that we would expect a nil return in for that as well so that we can just do some really good checks to make sure that we've had that in. Um, paid and unpaid leave, um, is a pen 04 and that's that's the case for everybody I think at the moment is that we're asking for, for those forms to come in and also the same with any parental absences those are a pen 05 um, and I think I just wanted to mention here as well that um, for anybody who goes on to a non-paid period now for any maternity or parental absences it's important that you're informing your employees that they only have 30 days on return in which to cover that period if they wish to have it as a shared cost um, APC with their employer. At the moment there's no um, discretion to extend that time limit and if they go outside of the 30 days it will be a full cost to themselves. So you might just want to have a look at your procedures on that just to make sure that somewhere that they're being informed of that um, and obviously again, there's further the information on our website on how that is. So that's just a little bit there about um, extra contributions that can be paid. So I've just mentioned APC, so that's additional pension contributions. And that's where somebody can, if they want to, buy themselves an extra bit of pension. But also then covers where they can buy lost pension uh, due to absences. Additional voluntary contributions are still around in exactly the same credential. And then we'll probably still have people that are paying from the old scheme, additional <coughs> contributions, it really is a slide of acronyms, as well, isn't it? <laughs> which are the ARCs, um, and extra contributions for us must be recorded separately. So again, those of you that are using the monthly return will know that you've got separate columns for those, but we're also having to account separately for APCs and also for anybody who's paying into the 50-50 scheme. So we need to know those contributions separately, the totals each month. So looking a little bit at levers then, um, that's the nice form that you all love with lots of boxes and lots of information needed. Um, but um, it's obviously important that we get that as soon as you're able to give it when you're happy um, that the final pay has gone through. And it allows the pensions team, it allows us then to calculate benefits, um, be it a refund of contributions or a deferred or a retirement. Um, and just sort of a note there, Debbie, Debbie's already gone through with ill health, the kind of things that we need coming in with the leavers for for an ill health retirement. But if it's a redundancy or a flexible retirement as well, there's likely to be backup documents that we'd need, notice letter or a business case if it's a flexible retirement. And again, for anybody who's, um, uh, well, for all of you really, if, if you can send us through P45, um, then again, that's really helpful because it just helps the individual with their tax. Um, should anybody, um, any of your employees die, um, then as soon as we know about it, the better. Obviously, it's a really sensitive issue. Um, and as much information you can give us on any known next of kin as well would be really helpful. Um, and it might be that you give us a call about that and then we'll follow up with the leavers form afterwards just so that we're aware of that. Opt-outs. Um, again, you need to tell us about all of your opt-outs. Um, I think you know, this has been quite good fun since auto-enrolment come in. We've been trying to get procedures in place so that um, we've, we're told of all of, our, all of your opt-outs. Um, they have to come to us for the form. Um, to opt out, but that doesn't necessarily then mean that we know they're doing that, and we also know that you know that's what they, they went ahead and did. 
and um, so you must tell us because we now have to keep a record of all those opt-outs which we never had to do before auto-enrolment. So just a little bit there on the retirement process, just a few points to think about, um, you know, if people are thinking of retiring. Um, it's probably important to make sure that individuals know because normal retirement ages have now changed um, over the last few years, there's sort of been you know, possibly three different retirement ages for some people retiring, that they know that they might, you know, to check whether there's going to be any reductions to any certain parts of their pension. Um, and that flexible ill health redundancy are obviously still um, an employer's consent uh, needed. And um, sort of as I just mentioned a little bit with leavers form, to make sure that they come through when you're happy with final pay, I think um, it's important to note here that until you're, we, we will only provide provisional figures until you know, you're happy that you're giving us the final pay. Um, individuals can have provisional figures so that they can start to think about what they want to convert pension to lump sum to be. We can um, start to gather any certificates that we might need and bank details and that kind of thing. But until the actual final pay has gone through, um, it isn't until that point that we would then make any payments um, for, for that retirement. Um, and what we're doing is some checks from anybody who's sending us in the monthly return. We are looking at checking the pay against the cumulative figure you give on that. And we are finding some discrepancies. So, you know, we're obviously working with employers on what that, those might be. But if it does turn out that the leavers form didn't have the correct pay on it, a payment might have been made afterwards, then that might mean that we've got to recalculate somebody's benefits that are already in payment. Um, and obviously, if we've been overpaying somebody, that, that could cause a problem. Uh, likewise, if we've, we've been underpaying as well. Okay. So, um, as Becky's already mentioned, um, we've now got two definitions of pensionable pay in place. Um, so, one or two things changed under the new 2014 regulations. Uh, I think one of the big things is that it now um, includes all overtime and all additional hours, whereas before it only included contractual overtime. Um, I'm not quite sort of sure how much of a big issue that's made to budgets for people, um, because obviously em employers are paying on the same. Um, and also, um, there that the 2014 definition is using actual pay. I've already mentioned a little bit about full-time equivalent pay um, and I think um, this is the one thing that's probably going to be causing issues for some employers because when we get to year end we are going to have to have a full-time equivalent pensionable pay for every employee as per the 2008 pay definition um, and then also will need the pay that they've had for the year um, under the 2014 definition so we're going to need the total care pay for the year but we're also going to need a full-time equivalent. So for a full-timer who's had no change through the year, they're likely to be the same if they had no um, extras paid as well. But there's not many of those around, so any part-timers, it, it is going to be different. And I know from feedback that already some, some employers are, and know that that's a bit of a problem uh, with how their payroll can deal with it. And then also just to note there about assumed pensionable pay, um, it is to be used in all cases of um, where there's been any nil pay for anybody who's on a sickness absence or during a no pay period of, of child related leave. And Becky's going to run through some examples in a moment on what could happen to somebody's benefits if we didn't receive the right pay or if assumed pensionable pay wasn't used. <laughs> so this is Tony Test. Um, this uh, person works for Shropshire Council. And um, basically this screen's just showing um, some of the general information that you send us through for a new starter. So all their personal details, date of birth, that kind of thing. Um, and then as we look into some of the record, um, we can see that this person joined the fund back there in 2010. But we can also see we've got a different date here. Um, where, so that means that something has obviously changed to the record a little bit later than their start date. Um, and I know that that was because the person did go um, part-time for a while. Um, it's not all showing on this screen, so bear with me. So I know here, this, is, this uh, record is where we're totting up the service, if you like, 
for all the benefits based up to the 31st of March 2014. So this is where at year end over the years you've been, well you've been, you've been giving us any hours changes um, and we've been popping them all in on here and adding up that service. Um, what we then do from the year end return and what we've been doing in the past is on the scheme contributions, we've been bringing all of those through so we can see there that for this person they've had contributions coming for every year that they've been in. And then here at the end of 2012, that was the year when they were at part time, so the contributions had dropped for that year. And what we've been doing is taking those contributions based on the rate that you've given us as well, and the hours that we hold on the record, we've been working out a full time equivalent pensionable pay. And we've then been putting it here on our pay record. And then what we've done is looked at the previous years and if it's gone down or gone up considerably that's when we've been coming back to you with those sort of queries have they had a break in service have they been off sick have you told us about the right hours changes so for quite a number of years we've been doing that we can't do that anymore because of the way that the, uh, the schemes changed from the contributions coming in now we're not going to be able to do that calculation so that is why you're going to have to now give us that full-time equivalent pensionable pay and what you then give us will be used on the annual benefit statements going out to the employees later on in the year. So then at the same time, we'll then need to have the care pay. And for those of you that have been sending in the monthly returns, we have been posting quarterly rather than monthly the pair, that, that care pay onto their record. So it's been going on here. Um, so for this person, um, from the 1st of April to the 31st of October, the care pay was £14,000. That has already worked out a 49th amount and is then showing there how much pension they've actually built up to that point in time. So what we'll do is just have a look now. The individuals can then actually go in and see that building up themselves. As we would have come to the screen with personal details, so already we can see from that then that all the um, details that we've got on our system has filtered through for the member to check themselves. And the box at the left hand side are in all the different options that they can then do various things. So you'll see um, the one that's the benefit uh, projector so they can go in and do some counts themselves. Um, and then they can also update some of their um, details on there as well so they can tell us if they've changed their name or their address or their email address. Um, but the uh, one, hopefully, oops. Yeah, so um, again, filtering through there then is the membership details. So the uh, service that um, we've been building up from the hours changes that you've been telling us about. And then um, the financial details screen will then just be pulling through the pay um, that we've got, the last pay figure that we've got in against them. Uh, when they started in their post and the contribution rate that we currently hold that they should be paying. So they might look at that and think, that's not my pay, that's not the rate I'm paying at, and then come back and query. So we would check then to see whether we're holding the right data. So by clicking on the latest valuation um, button, which is the second one on that left hand box, that will then do a quick calculation and will bring through what the current pension value is for that individual. Um, so um, towards the bottom there where we've got care benefits of 384.51 and the final salary benefits um, that will then be the split between the two schemes and then what they can do is drill into that care benefits um, payment select that line oh. They can select that line and they can then see their, their account building up um, as we've um, shown on the, on the record. So uh, as we're posting in that care pay, it's totting up that account exactly as if you were going into your own bank account really and they can see exactly how much pension they're building up. When it gets to the end of the year, it's going to revalue and then it can show another line for next year and it'll just keep totting up until they, uh, they get to retirement. Um. I'm just going to, have, I've just got a couple of examples really of what could happen if um, the data you provide us um, is wrong. So it, we generally have very good data, so it's not um, kind of a, a reflection of um, what we have at the moment. So don't, um, it's not based on any examples or anything like that, but it's just to put into perspective really of the information that you provide us. If you haven't got that already, from what Charles has showed you, that it does feed directly into what that member sees on their um, benefit records and also um, what we ultimately pay. So. Um, it's just to give you some idea really of what um, information could go wrong. So, 
if an overpayment example, so this goes back to the point of there's two definitions of pensionable pay, so the 2008 definition and the 2014 definition. The 2008 definition doesn't include um, overtime or additional hours, but it does only include overtime if it's contractual. So non-contractual overtime for two, the 2008 definition isn't pensionable, so those um, payments shouldn't have ever had any contributions taken off them. If it was contractual, so that person had to do it, it was written in their contract, um, and they would know about that, because obviously they had to do it, those payments that you were making to them would then have pension contributions deducted. After the 1st of April um, last year, I was in this year, in 2015, um, after the 1st of April last year, um, the definition changed. So the 2014 definition of pensionable pay includes all overtime and additional hours. So that's the point that me and Charlie have kind of been making. So um, if you just get a bit mixed up um, and um, decide to give us one pay figure, um, not taking into consideration the pre and post 2014 definition, so this example shows this person's date of birth in 1956, they joined the scheme in 1981, so they've got quite significant pre-2014 and 2008 service, so this is why uh, when you see the example they may seem a bit extreme, but we're based on someone joining the scheme back in the 80s. And um, their salary included only contractual overtime is £25,000, and um, the non-contractual overtime um, that they do is £5,000. So you provided us with a total salary figure of 30,000. I feel a bit scary slide, really. But that top um, line, I'm just going to use the cursor here. So, um, so if you provide us with 30,000, we don't pick it up, and we use 30,000 based on pre-2014 um, when we were final salary scheme, and post-14. So we used the 30,000 not knowing that that um, non-contractual overtime Shouldn't, um, but that is for, uh, for non-contractual overtime, which shouldn't have been pensionable. We calculate someone's pension based on the 80th, the 60th, and the 49th, so that's the three different schemes rate of accrual. We calculate someone's pension as 13,737, and then pay them a lump sum of 30 grand. <coughs> we actually, um, you realise, oh no, or we re realise, so we actually recalculate their, uh, their uh, benefits their pre-2014 should have just been that 25,000, <coughs> should have included that 5,000 pound non-contractual overtime because that isn't in the pensionable pay definition at that point. So it should be 25,000 for the pre-2014 definition and 30,000 for the post-2014 so the care pension because at this point um, now this, that 5,000 pound is pensionable. So we calculate that person's benefit and that gives them a benefit of 11,000. I'm sure the person won't jump up too much if they realise they may have been overpaid, but we still have to take, we still have to recalculate that pension and actually say, no, I'm sorry, we need we actually owe you a pension of eleven thousand, not thirteen. So the member's gonna be a bit annoyed and then obviously we, there's a lot of unpicking there of someone's pension benefits. And for finance people in the room, the funding um, um, of that pension, so actually what that pension pot is worth in terms of that person, we you always use a, a factor of twenty. So Actually, that's when you take into consideration that uh, original pension of 13,000, but then using the um, correct pension of 11, there's actual funding difference there for, of for 48,000 pounds, which is a huge amount of money to, um, um, to be overpaid, really. Okay, so there's that example. And there's just an underpayment example, really, on the opposite end. So, um, as Trevor said, uh, the assumed pensionable pay. So if someone's been off sick for a, a long period, a period of time or moved on to a period of reduced or no pay, you should be using the assumed pensionable pay, which is basically the pay that they were receiving before they uh, dropped to on reduced or nil pay. So in this example, we're working to um, the actual pensionable pay figure has been provided. So the actual pay is what they've received, but that's the reduced amount. So that's been provided but the APP, the assumed pensionable pay, should have been 30 grand because that's what they were on before they dropped to that uh, reduced domain. So, so see, no public surprises here that if we use that 15,000, which was their actual pay of what they received, but wasn't included any assumed pensionable pay, we calculated this person's pension of 5,369 pounds. This is example, probably the person is gonna go, oh, hold on, my benefit statement's been saying completely different to that, that's been paid been based on their assumed pensionable pay or their actual pay. 
So we recalculate their benefits based on the 10,000, but then again, from a funding point of view, the same um, calculation, the same formula there, using a factor of 20, that's a huge funding difference of 118,000 pounds. So these are really scary figures, I understand, you know, it's a bit scary, it's like after we've just been talking about data, but it's just some real examples really of how just that little fine not knowing about the definition between 2008 and 2014 could impact on your budgets and also members' benefits. So they are extreme examples, so I don't want to end our presentation on a bit, on a bit of a scare, scare, scary note, but it's always worth knowing the, um, the implications. And that's why we're here, really, just to, I'm doing this presentation just to show you really of what exactly we need to ensure that we don't get anything wrong. So there's other re repercussions if any of the information is wrong. There's valuation only three, three years. Obviously, it slows down for the member any of their processes, any of the retirement stuff. And obviously, if our time is taken up um, picking errors up and things like that, it, it slows down what the other services we, we provide you in terms of estimates and things like that.